So today is February 9th, and there's a lot of important months of our year. And I, everyone likes to know, right? anyone that knows me when I give a talk, I'd like to be able to connect us with our history. Because we have a tendency of forgetting. We have a tendency of forgetting what happened yesterday. So this is all important information for us because it reminds us of who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. It reminds us of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al-Kareem, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are then are you going? And we all know that we are destined to return to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we say, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِيُونَ But in order for you to return, you have to know where you came from. There was an origin. And there was a day that all of our souls stood in straight lines in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognized Him subhanahu wa ta'ala in His magnanimity as our Lord. And so we're now in a situation where we have a history and we have to understand what our origin is as a people, as a community, as a culture. So on the fifth day of Jamaat al-Awwal, this was the birth of our mother, Bibi Zainab bin Ali, Bibi Zainab al Kubra, the sister of Imam al Hussein, and one of the great leaders of our Ummah and one of the one of the incredible examples for any woman to have as a as a person coming into maturity, looking at her life example and studying, and understanding her piety and her ability to speak and truth in the face of injustice. The fifteenth day was the birth of Imam Zain al Abidi, the sole member of Imam Hussein's male family to survive Kabul. The twentieth day of Jamaat al-Awwal marks the day that Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih opened Constantinople. I actually mentioned the same event some years ago. I think it was maybe three or four years ago in the same place. Now, he's the person that the Prophet Sallallahu saw, or mentioned, excuse me, mentioned in the Hadith when he says, Constantinople shall be conquered. And he says, Ni'mat al amin how blessed the commander, or Ni'mat the judge, how blessed the army. This hadith had such an impact upon so many of the Sahaba that if you were to go to Constantinople today, Istanbul, you'll find many Sahaba that are buried there, and in particular, Ayyub al Ansari, who was at the time under the army of Sayyidina Mu'awiyah. And he went to attempt to conquer Constantinople at age 83. And that is where he was martyred and where he was buried. Because he remembered this hadith. <coughs> that Constantinople will be open for us. And if you, to go, if you were to go to this day in certain parts of the city, you will actually see this hadith written outside of Topkapi Palace and many other places. So, Sultan Muhammad al Fatih, this hadith is narrated in Imam Ahmad's collection, Imam Tabarani, in Bukhari Sharif, Imam Suyuti's collections, and uh, Hafiz al Dubar. He was Hanafi in his fiqh. He was Maturidi in his aqidah, and he was Qadi in his tariqah. There were 14 attempts on his life. 14 times people tried to kill him and assassinate him. When he finally died, it was due to poisoning, but he was age 49. He was a young man when he died. He was tall. He was muscular. And he had a full face. He was, according to all the people of his time, one of the most knowledgeable human beings alive at his time. He was foremost in poetry, in fiqh. He was an artist. He was a master of the Arabic language, of science, mathematics, astronomy, and theology and he had mastered Turkish, Arabic, Persian, Greek, and Latin. This was how a leader was developed. We have leaders now that can't even speak their own native language. They don't even make sense when they speak. This is how a leader was developed, identified, cultivated, and brought up in order to lead a, a collection of people, a community of people. He never disclosed his secrets to people. He kept his, his plans close to his chest. And 
they say about him, and even many of the people who are around him, his inner circle said that he was unparalleled in controlling his nafs. He had a tremendous ability to control his lower self. And he was always calm in the face of tribulation or trouble. He conquered Serbia, Albania, Bosnia, Romania, a portion of the Greek kingdom, Hungary, and Monrovia. And when he expanded the empire, he set over 40,000 prisoners free, just as, as a showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He codified criminal, the, criminal, the criminal justice system and constitutional law in the Ottoman Empire. Interestingly enough, if a person wants to understand the nature of the dunya, quite literally, and because I'm only mentioning he codified the criminal law system, where the head or the main prison was in all of Istanbul, today stands, in built in the exact same building, stands the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. If that is not an analogy for how to understand dunya, I don't know what is. This was the public jail, the public jail for, for criminals, like the dungeons where they put criminals. What stands there today, they bought the exact same building and they just built the inside differently, is the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Think of that as a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His enemies that tried to fight against him, they called him the Great Eagle just out of sheer reverence for who he was. <coughs> the head of the, of the Greek Orthodox Church at that time was in Istanbul. The Christians were scared. He codified it, he protected it for them. To this day, the head of the Greek, Roman, Roman, or the Greek Orthodox <coughs> Church still remains in Istanbul. He protected the churches and the synagogues, he protected religious freedoms, and even when he converted the Hagia Sophia into the masjid, he didn't destroy all of the previous relics that were there, he simply covered them up. And on Sundays, he would allow the Christians to worship inside of the building. They divided it and allowed the Christians to use it for their mass service on Sundays. He was an incredible human being. February 21st, or this month is also the month of black history. And as Muslims living in this country, we, we should understand that we are not present here. We don't preserve our tradition here. We don't have a connection with this deen unless we understand the people that came before us. And that there must be a recognition of the African American community and what they did to preserve our deen in this country. In particular on February 21st, the martyrdom of the Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. Sheikh Hamza told me that he had a chance to go and see the Qur'an Kareem that Malcolm X, the Hajj Malik Shabazz, studied. He said there was a, it, it epitomized a person who was dedicated to God, who was searching for the truth. He said he saw notes and highlights literally on every single page of the Qur'an. It just wasn't underlined or highlighted. There were specific notes written. And references from one surah to the other, connecting different ideas, connecting commandments, Quranic commandments. Like Imam Haddad says, when you read the Quran, don't think, just don't read it like a story. Look at the Quranic injunctions. Look at the prohibitions. Look at the good advice. All of this was studied deeply. How many of us in this room can literally say that we've read the Qur'an cover to cover, not just in the Arabic language. Some of us may not have even done that. We should be for devotional practices, but really trying to understand what our Lord has told us to do. This advice is for myself. Wallah al it's for me. I don't mean to be a hypocrite in any shape or form. This is truly the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the infinite speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are supposed to read and understand. Iqra this. So, Ibn Atta'Allah starts, I'm going to give some good advice from Ibn Atta'Allah. He says in Taj al-Arus, he says, when you enter into the prayer, you enter into a private conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, and you talk to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa for you say, peace be unto you. Ayyuhan Nabiwa. Right? Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan Nabiwa wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And he says in the Arabic language, 
The Arabs only use ayuha followed by a definite noun when they're actually addressing a person directly. Some of the awliya, some of the uh, ulama, they had people, they're not necessarily admissible in court, but they would not continue in their prayer until they got to this place and were present with the Prophet Because they realized that they were sending their salams to the Prophet. So Ibn Arabi, Shaykh al-Akbar says in Mishkat al-Anwar, he actually specifically talks in a bar hadith qudsi, narrated by Abu Huraira. Because we have to understand, what are we saying to God in our prayer? So his Abu Huraira said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have divided my prayer into two halves, between me and my servant. And my servant shall have that which he asks. When the servant says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Praise be to Allah, Lord of the Universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My servant is praised. This is the dialogue. You've just praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's a recognition. Ar Rahman al Rahim, the compassionate, the merciful. Allah says again, My servant has repeated my praise. Malik yawm al Din, sovereign king of the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My servant has glorified me. And in one narration, the Prophet sallallahu said, My servant has given himself over to me. wa It is you who we adore and whom you we ask for. And Allah says, This is between me and my servant. And my servant shall have that which he asks for. And when he says, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim Sirat al ladina anamta alihim awayr al mahdubi alihim wa ladhaameen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says This belongs to my servant And my servant shall have that for which he asks So when we recite the prayer When we recite the Fatiha We should recite it with presence And we should understand That there is a Dialogue happening between the the one who is worshipping and the one who is worshipped. There is a dialogue happening between the slave and the master. He continues, now that we understand even just one portion of what the prayer is, one portion of the Fatiha, he says, Ibn Ta'Allah, he says, two units of prayer in the middle of the night are better than a thousand rak'ahs in the day. And you only offer such prayers to find them that on the Yom Qiyamah they will weigh heavily on your scale of good deeds. Then he asked the question to you. Does anyone hire a servant or a worker only to find him eating and sleeping? He says, remember that you are a servant who has been purchased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're a servant who has been purchased by God. <coughs> Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purchased from, from the believers their lives and their property in exchange for giving them paradise. In exchange for paradise. This is the Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purchased from you the believers, from the mu'mineen, their lives and their properties. In exchange for Jannah. But a servant can't sit around and just eat and sleep all day. You actually have to do work. You wouldn't hire your gardener or people to come clean your home or people to do work around your home or employees if you're in a position of leadership. Any of those things if they only ate and slept while they were getting paid on the job. So the question you have to ask yourself is what am I doing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How am I being employed and being serviced? How am I going to service the community? How am I going to give back? How am I being a good abd? And then he says, anyone who does not place the obligations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon himself will find himself or his nafs clinging to him constantly and pulling him down. And anyone who does not make demands of himself, they'll find that the nafs will make demands of him. Obey me. Feed me. 
continue to do things for me rather than for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let go of your money. I need it. I need to increase the amount of money I have in the bank or whatever it is. Because were you to place yourself into the burdens of obedience of Allah, your nafs would not demand anything regarding disobedience from you. You wouldn't have the time. If you demand from your nafs obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the nafs will say. <coughs> Imam Ghazali says it's like training a dog. When you tell the dog, you can't be nice to it all the time. You actually have to tell the dog, sit down and be firm with it. That's when it sits. When you say roll over, it rolls over. You don't do it trying to be nice to it all the time. You actually must be firm in many cases. The same applies to the nafs. Like I said, this is advice to me. The righteous and the, and the devotees, they don't aimlessly cruise around at community celebrations. This is how he describes them. He says, and do not indulge yourself and amuse yourself too much, for this will distract you from your night prayers. <coughs> it is said to him, you distracted yourself away from us, so we distracted you away from worshiping. He says again, two rakahs in the night will weigh heavier for you than the mountain of Uhud on the Yom Qiyam. Now this is something amazing because I just had my trees trimmed at home. This is actually the most perfect time of the year to actually have your trees trimmed. If any of you need to do it, this is the time. Quite literally. He says, but for the members of the body that have become too rigid for ibadah, they're only fit for cutting off just like you have to trim your trees. When the branches dry up, you trim them. And they're only good for fire. The first thing that the gardener does when he trims the trees is cut off all the dead branches. And then he cuts even some of the healthy branches in order for the rest of the tree to grow. Sometimes you have to do that. You have to get rid of the dead. If we don't engage in ibadah, our limbs will literally become dead. You have to ask yourself, what portions of my soul, what limbs of my soul are challenged? What portions of my soul need to be trimmed? What portions of my life should be changed? What components of my day-to-day -day activities should I alter in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we do these things, He's given us the formula. If we do these things by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do it with ikhlas, we will find ourselves getting up in the night. May Allah make us amongst the people who get up in the night. Alhamdulillah, get up in the night. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.